Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Manifest. There's something the enemy does not want you to understand, and that is how that a word becomes a sword and becomes your weapon to fight every type of battle that the adversary is going to send you. I did a series some time back, an illustrated series on the book of Ephesians and the armor of God. And today we're going to talk about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Don't miss it. It's coming on right now. We're going to be dealing with the subject of when a word becomes a sword for battle, when a word from God becomes a sword in battle. Ephesians 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There's a second verse I'd like to use. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says this, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing asunder to the dividing of soul and spirit, the joints and marrows, and is, is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. For the next few moments, let me just share with you briefly a little bit about the history of the word of God. From Adam to Noah, there was no known written record of God's word. The first written record of God's word came when Moses wrote the five books, which we now have in our Bible called the Torah. Remember this, that Adam all the way to Noah, actually all the way to the Tower of Babel, men spoke one language. There's a lot of our older historians in America, older ministers from the 1700s and founders, and Jewish rabbis do believe this, that the original language of Noah, no, I'm sorry, of Adam, all the way to the time of Noah, was a form of the Hebrew language. As a matter of fact, Josephus writes about that at the Tower of Babel, when all the tongues were divided, that the only language that was not divided was the original language, guess what, which happened to be the Hebrew language. So there may be some, some fact behind that. So what we call Paleo-Hebrew uh, alphabet dates back 3,200 to 3,300 years ago when Moses penned the Torah. Now, the Torah, as you know, is the five books that are in our Bible. However, a Torah actually has a scroll. It's a scroll. And uh, the word Torah means to instruct, to teach. In Greek, it's called the Pentateuch. So when you hear someone talk about the Pentateuch, they're actually talking about the five books of Moses in the Old Testament. And that's the Greek name for them, Torah being the Hebrew name for them. Primarily, when you mention the Torah, you're talking about the first five books of the Bible written by Moses, but devout Jews often say the phrase Torah with the totality of Jewish teaching. A Torah scroll is very interesting because uh, the letters are written by a scribe. It takes one year for a scribe to put together an entire Torah scroll. Uh, many sheets of parchment from a kosher animal are used to produce a Torah scroll. Uh, they're written upon hand individual letters with a quill pen, a special type of ink. Then they are eventually sewed together and they make a very, very long scroll that is rolled up as you see a picture of it there. And actually the rollers are called the trees of life from the tree of life because the life is in God's word. The Torah has 304,805 individual letters and each page of a Torah has 42 lines and there are 4,000 laws a scribe has to know before he ever picks up a quill pen and starts writing the Torah. So how was God's word revealed? Because we're going to talk about the sword of the spirit being the word of God. Let's understand how God's word was revealed. Since the Torah is the first known written record from God out of heaven for mankind on record that we still have, then the word of God came to Moses. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 8 says this, with him, speaking of Moses, I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. Then Numbers chapter 12 and verse 8, this is a Hebrew translation. I will speak to Moses mouth to mouth manifestly and not in an allegory. It's pointed out by Jewish rabbis that the prophets of the Bible wrote visions and dreams and were inspired of the Holy Spirit to pen what they penned. The writing of the Torah, however, was unique in that God spoke to Moses face to face. Moses 
didn't write just as someone would under inspiration only. He wrote because God audibly gave the word, audibly spoke, and he put every letter, phrase, and word in place. This is why when the Jews copy the Torah, they are so precise, they are so detailed. They have such laws because they know God spoke each letter, God spoke each word. It has to be copied exactly the way that Moses copied it in the beginning. 74 times it says this, the Lord spake unto Moses saying. In Numbers 12 and verse six, it says, God spoke to others in dreams. Uh, but he spoke to his servant Moses different. In Exodus 33, verse 11, it said God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And then in Numbers chapter 7, verse 89, we read that he went into the tent of meeting and there Moses heard the voice of the Lord. So the first revelation from God is found in the Torah. The, then, then came the writings of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, all the wonderful prophets of the Bible. And then came the wisdom literature, which is Proverbs, Song of Solomon, uh, Ecclesiastes. And so we have the Old Testament, 39 books of the Old Testament uh, that are recorded under the inspiration of God. We have the books of our New Testament. One of those books, as you know, Paul's letter to the book of Ephesus, the uh, uh, church at Ephesus, the book of Ephesians is what we're dealing with. But let me talk a little bit more about the word. Look at this list. There are symbols of the word in the Bible. A hammer, Jeremiah 23 and 9, to break the hardness in men's heart. A fire, Jeremiah chapter 23, 29, to refine from uncleanness. A mirror, James 1, 23, to reflect the image of God. A seed, 1 Peter chapter 1, 23, to produce spiritual fruit. A laver, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, to cleanse from sin. A, a lamp, Psalms 119, 105, to guide and direct. A sword, Hebrews chapter 4 and 12, to save separate and defend. And right here, I would like to take a moment and I won't take long, just a brief moment to share with you a dream that I had that has stuck with me for over 40 years. Right after Pam and I were married, we left Northport, Alabama. I did a very dumb thing. I never had a honeymoon. I was so booked up in revivals, I couldn't cancel my meetings. So I got married on a Friday, drove to Gastonia, uh, North Carolina on Saturday and started preaching on Sunday, a revival that went three weeks every night. Of course, we got embarrassed by the pastor because he got up and said, this is the honeymoon revival. And everyone laughed when he said that. Pam still talks about that. Middle of the night, I think it was the first night that we'd arrived. This was been on the Saturday night. If I had a calendar, I could tell you the exact date. I went into a dream and in the dream I'm standing and I see four doors that I have the opportunity to go into. Now remember, about that time, I'm about 22 years of age, been preaching since I was 18 and I'm newly married and I'm evangelizing. And I see this door and I, I, and I won't go through all the doors. One of them was a university with a bunch of college kids goofing off. I said, that's not for me. I went into another door and I'm being sincere when I say this. It was the political church door. Men were in their suits. They were being very political. I knew if I went through that door, I could work my way up in the system. And I said, I don't want that. I'm not going that way. And there was other doors that I saw. The first, fourth door and the door I chose said persecution. And I thought, well, this is a crazy door to choose, but out of the other three, I'd rather have this one than the other three. When I walked in, there were, there were spirits that were shrouded in dark capes and I didn't see their faces and they had swords in their hand. And I thought, oh my, why have I chosen this? And the Lord threw me a sword. It's like it landed in my hand. It was so strong, it took two hands to hold it. And I started swinging. And Dr. Cutshaw, I remember getting into these battles with these spirits. Then the Lord would say to me, just cut their hands off. When you cut the hand off, it can't hold the sword. And I cut the hand of one off and it would flee, but here would come another one. And it would flee and it would come another one. Then the Lord gave this word to me, which I have never forgot. And I want you to hear how he said it. He said, blessed is he who is skilled with the sword. He will never fall. Whew. And the Holy Spirit hit me and I'm still reliving that. And it's like he said, if a man or woman will take the word and put it so into their heart and into their spirit, then the enemy can try whatever he wants to try. And that man and woman will still be standing when the battle's over. They won't fall in a wound or they won't fall in defeat. They'll be able to stand no matter what. Now, I'm going to give you four things that the Lord taught me in this spiritual dream that I think will help many of you. Number one, the length of the sword 
depends on the amount of knowledge you have of the Word of God. So in other words, it's not just a sword is a sword is a sword. Any word from God is a sword. We'll talk about that. But your length of your sword that you have, that you carry yourself, depends on the amount of the knowledge of God's word that you have. And I have a little quotable moment here. You can't quote what you don't know and you can't swing what you can't hold. <laughs> I think that's good enough to run through the bridge one more time. You can't quote what you don't know and you can't swing what you can't hold. So the more word you can contain and hold and the fact that you can learn to quote, that gives you the weaponry that you need in the sword. Number two, the word is only a sword when it is spoken out of a believer's mouth. God's word, God's spoken word is two edged, but it will not cut the enemy till you speak it. People, people, this is very important that you understand this. The word is not just intended to be read. It's intended to be spoken. And this is this is how it becomes a weapon. This is how it becomes the sword of the spirit when you begin to speak it. The third thing I learned was this. The impact of the sword will depend upon your faith level when you're speaking the word that you know. Now I say this because people can sometimes get into what I call spiritual formulas and they use a formula. Well, if I pray this verse nine times, if I say this seven times, if I confess this three times, then it's all going to work. This is not about a formula. It's about your simple faith in what you believe and what you know, and you know it works. Now listen to this. The enemy is not required to obey your rebuke when it's done in unbelief. Jesus cannot answer a prayer of unbelief. He cannot heal a sick person who does not believe. He cannot baptize anyone with the Holy Spirit. Someone said, well, God can do what he wants. No, you have to understand. It's a spiritual law that unbelief stops the blessing. In Nazareth, he could do no mighty miracles because of their unbelief. So when you're in unbelief, it doesn't matter what you're praying for or whatever. Unbelief limits, always will, the miraculous power of God in any situation that you're dealing with. So the enemy is, it, the enemy is not required to obey your rebuke if you're rebuking him in unbelief. Can I give you the example? The disciples are praying for a boy with epilepsy. Nine disciples can't cast the spirit out. Jesus comes off the mountain, bam, cast the spirit out. The disciples said, why could not we cast him out? Jesus said, because of your unbelief. The spirit in the boy knew whether or not those disciples had faith and it detected they didn't. Let me give you a quick example and then we'll move on. Years ago, and I, this, I was told this in the state of Maryland many years ago, that a mother had a son that she felt was demon possessed. And she asked the pastor to come and pray. Pastor comes to the house, walks in the boy's room, and the demon manifests through the boy's voice and said, you can't cast me out, you're too full, you love food. And the pastor got under total conviction and he said to the mom, don't tell him, but I'll be back in a couple of days. And he went home. He told his wife, for the next three days, I'm not eating anything. I'm just drinking water. Don't, nobody's bothering me. Tell him I'm in prayer. And he fasted and prayed three days, went back to the house. He told the mom, I'm coming over. Don't tell him I'm coming. The pastor knocked on the door. The boy opened the door. The demon spoke and said, oh my, you've been with Jesus. <laughs> and the boy was delivered. Now, the point I make is that spirits can discern faith and spirits can discern unbelief, just like the Holy Spirit can discern faith and the Holy Spirit can discern unbelief. So I did find out, number four, a person's obedience to the word can prevent a person from falling. When I say falling, it doesn't just mean falling into sin. It can mean falling out of faith. It can mean falling into unbelief. It can mean falling into doubt. So that is a very important thing to understand. Now unto him, I love this verse, who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So let's talk for a moment now about the different types of swords. Now, before I do it, I'm going to show you an actual sword. This is, this is one of my pieces from the private collection that I have. I have one of my hobbies is to collect real antiquities. Everything I have, there's nothing copied. When I saw this, my dear friend who I've known since he was a little boy, I said, make me the best deal that you can. And trust me, I have a deal that's ridiculous. What I'm about to show you is a museum piece. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a Persian sword from the Persian empire. 
and you can see it's made of heavy iron. Uh, the handle, this, the, of course, the handle is here. It's believed that there was a strap that went here that they put their hand through so that, you know, if it, if it slipped, they would still be able to hold on to it. It's double edge. It's very heavy. The green is called patina. It happens to bronze coins. It happens to anything with bronze or metal. And you'll, it's, it's, it will be greenish. You don't want to polish this. You don't want to ever do, if you ever get an old coin that's got patina, leave it alone. You polish it, you wreck the value of it. And this is very heavy. This was used in war. This was used in battle. And I know it's kind of hard to, to hold this and say, you mean you've got that? Well, it's a piece of history. Someone was slain with this sword, maybe hundreds of people. Now, I'm not proud of that, but I'm showing you the history of the Persian Empire right here. This is one of the swords. Now, if you could feel this, it's extremely heavy. It's very dull. In fact, you can see the edge here. It has taken some blows from something, probably from other swords that hit it. But it's very heavy. And this sword was found uh, in an excavation. And so this is actually, make it bronze, make it look bronze. This is what a, it would felt like. And I'm telling you, I'm not the strongest guy up in this room by any means, but you had to be a very, very strong individual to carry, to, to, to bear a sword. One of David's mighty men in the Bible, I don't know if you're aware of this, he took on the Philistines till it said the sword clave to his hand. And I could actually see if you were in a battle how that would be possible. Now, let's go over to a replica. I'm gonna pick one of these out here because both of them are the same. They just have a different design. So I'll have to use this older one that's more rusty looking. One of them is a little bit cleaner on the blade than, uh, than this. Now, uh, what I want to show you is the types of swords that were used in the Roman Empire. Now, we should have a picture of these, and we will go back to this one in, in just a moment. There was something called the Gladius Hispaninus, and this uh, was a particular sword that, uh, that the Romans began to adopt around 3 B.C., they encountered it in Spain. It's called the Hispanic sword. The blade was 30 to 33 inches long and two inches wide, tapered to a point made of steel, and it was two edged. The handle uh, had uh, ridges on it to grip for the fingers to be able to get a better grip. And the owner's name was always engraved on the blade, not the handle, but on the blade. All right. And this is, a, it was actually a very cumbersome sword. It was very heavy. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, it took two hands to hold this particular blade up. And this is where we get the word gladiator from from the, this name of this sword because it was a sword which was used by gladiators. The second sword is called the Pompey sword. The Pompey sword is named after the town of Pompey. It was shorter than the gladius and it had a double edge blade to it. The blade was about 16 inches by two inch, uh, long by two inches wide and it weighed about 1.5 pounds. Four of these were found during excavations in Pompey. And as you know, Pompey is where, where Mount Vesuvius erupted and all the city was swallowed in ashes. But when they excavated, and we've been to Pompeii, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's shocking. It's sad when you see these bodies that are still encased, that they, little dogs with their arms folded where the gas killed them, women that were pregnant, bent over, still encased. Now, when I say encased, their bodies was, were, were encased and they preserved them. You can't see the body, but they're preserved. It's like a mummy almost in Pompeii. But these swords were found there. Then we have what's called the Calvary sword. It was long, straight, single edged, uh, uh, made of iron and steel. There should be a picture of that there on the screen for you. And uh, this blade, the blade of the Calvary sword was called the Spatha and it averaged about 27 inches in length. Now notice these, they're all swords, but some have one blade, some have two blades, some are shorter, some are longer. Then there's what's called the Mercuria. The Mercuria sword was 19 inches long, razor sharp and two edged. And it had a very, very sharp point to it, to it. You could pull the insides of a man out with the twist of this sword. Now there are five keys to the Roman sword. And, uh, and here's, here's what they are. The Roman sword was a required weapon. Number two, the Roman sword was carried at all times. Number three, the Roman sword had to be two edged. Number four, the Roman sword was both offensive and defensive as a weapon. Number five, the Roman soldier's sword could be dull and required being sharpened. So let's show you uh, again, all of these here. I have uh, this one back here. 
And this one is a little different because this one's case is a, a little bit of metal with uh, wood attached to it. And this one is leather. Most of them are going to be placed in leather. But this is, uh, again, the sword that Paul talked about when he talked about the sword of the spirit. He used that fourth Greek word there that I mentioned a moment ago, the two edged one, about 19 inches in length. You can see the examples here, but we'll take this out of its leather pouch so that you can get a view. And again, these are exact replicas, uh, the way they were made. That's the sword that the Roman soldiers went to battle with. And you can see, and once again, just like the Persian sword, the authentic one that we just showed you, although this is a replica, it's very, very, uh, uh, it, there's a weight to it. You have to be able to carry it. Now, imagine you have to be in battle. You've got yourself protected. You've got your back covered with your armor. You've got your helmet on for the blows from the back of the head. But your real battle is the face-to-face -face conflict. Now, you can see uh, this one has been dulled a little bit, obviously, because we don't want anybody to get cut. But this was a very, very sharp sword. It came to a point they would thrust... And if you thrust properly the enemy, like if you, you could thru thrust into the leg, thrust under the armor, thrust in the neck, there were certain places, thrust in the arm, it would do great, great damage. But if, if you swung this way and were cut and you cut an artery, the person would definitely bleed to death. So this is the sword that Paul would have had in mind, or should I say the replica that I'm holding, Paul would have had in mind and they were kept predominantly in a leather case. And here's your leather case. Why did they do that? Of course, they did that to protect it. Because if you know anything about metal, the elements eventually can cause rust to come. Uh, even I'll tell you a story about this armor. This is copies of the armor. But look here. Can you see the, see the, the metal there, how it's rusted? And you had to use oils and you had to keep this stuff uh, from rusting. Ladies and gentlemen, have you noticed, have you observed that the battles are intensifying? The mental battles, spiritual battles, physical infirmities. I've never seen a time when so many good Christian people are experiencing strange sicknesses and attacks of the enemy. Some time back, we did something very unique. It took me one year to study this subject, and I decided to take the 80 pages of notes or so that I had and take a platform at the Omega Center International and take the armor of God and so many other things and illustrate to you what Paul was talking about in the book of Ephesians. I want to make available to you today this seven disc. These are seven DVDs and it's a series called Ephesians in Depth, The Warrior's Strategy. On disc one, we're going to talk about Christianity versus the Roman Empire. Disc two, walking and warring as a Christian. Disc three, oh, this one is deep, wrestling with the satanic spirits that Paul alluded to in the book of Ephesians. Disc four, the armor of the Christian warrior, and it's all illustrated. Disc five, when the word becomes a sword for battle. There's three parts to that. You only saw two on manifest. Disc six, caring for and anointing the shield in the time of battle and feet that can stand and not slip in the conflict. Again, all illustrated. And disc seven, four part series, the Christian's battle strategy in the time of the end. Now, these 23 different lessons, 30 minute segments each, almost 12 hours of teaching. How do you get it? You go to perrystone.org, 1-888-21-BREAD, or write and send in a check at Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. We're going to do a very special offer for $75 or more, your donation of $75 or more. Request it. The offer number is on the screen right now. And ask for this series, all DVD, all illustrated messages. Once again, you can go through the three methods to order, but I'm going to ask you to do it today. And it is for a donation of $75 or more. Now, that's amazing because these are seven DVDs. And again, it's 30 minute segments with 23 different lessons. It would actually be great for a home Bible study, for a church group, or personally for you to sit at home and get this word in you to help you defeat the enemy and overcome these end time battles that Satan is sending into your life. We're looking to hear from you and to keep manifest on the air. It's important that you respond to these offers. Keep watching. God bless you. Well, folks, this is the offer. This is a fabulous teaching. 
and just hour after hour after hour, 23, 30 minute lessons. And it's illustrated. It's not a talking head looking at you. And I don't mean that disrespectful, but this is a, a whole platform with props through all the teaching. So please get this. It is needed right now more than ever before because I have never seen in my life of preaching 47 years and being alive almost 65 years, such warfare, weird warfare. And some of it people are bringing on themselves and some people are defiling their own spirit because they're listening to so much junk that's defiling them that the Bible warns you about. So this is extremely necessary at this time. Now, I will be showing you some places that I'm gonna be coming to in the very near future. April the 12th, 13th, and 14th, I'm coming to Monroe, Louisiana. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Ron Brown's church, and it's the House of Prayer International. Again, April the 12th, 13th, and 14th. Don't forget the International Prophetic Summit at the end of April. Now, at this time, registration is probably closed because we've, we've, we've filled up the building. But it, you that are planning on coming, don't let anything hinder you from attending that. On May 16th and 17th, I'll be in San Diego, California, back at the Morsarella Legacy Center for the Feast of Pentecost celebration. Uh, you can check with their website for that information. July 18th to the 21st, Evangel World Press Center in Louisville, Kentucky. That'll be a Thursday night, two services, Friday, Saturday, and all day Sunday. Then we're coming on August the 4th to Charleston, Arkansas, to um, uh, Life Church. Uh, Pastor Terry Scott's church, and we're going to be there for one service only. That's August the 4th. And then on the 16th of August, we'll be coming back to Family Faith Church, the Willis Campus, on the 16th and the 18th of August. That's a Friday and Saturday. And then on Sunday, we always go over to the Huntsville Camp Campus, which is uh, Pastor Jeff's church there. Oh, we love coming to town. You guys in Texas better come out and see me because I love seeing you all when I come down to Texas, and I mean that. And then on August the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, Huntington, West Virginia, Christ Temple Church, and that's one of those yearly events. There's a couple places that we try to go to every year because of the relationship we have with the church and with the pastor for sometimes 20 to 25 years. And so go to perrystone.org for more information, Perrystone Ministries Facebook page, Perrystone YouTube channel, and keep up with us. Some big things are happening in the fall I'll tell you about later. God bless you. Perry Stone invites you to the most anticipated weekend in biblical prophecy. Join us April 25th through 28th at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee for the 2024 International Prophetic Summit. Come hear the latest prophetic insights from Perry Stone, Jonathan Kahn, Lance Walnow, Bill Cloud, Mark Biltz, and Billy Crone. Go to perrystone.org to sign up now. Don't miss the biggest prophetic event of the year the 2024 Prophetic Summit. Register now.